sessions of presentations. This is a flexible schedule in the sense that if there's a conflict, I'm handing it out now, if there's a conflict, we can barter and trade as far as that goes. I've got an extra day scheduled because something will come up and someone won't be able to do it one day. I'm also scheduling 8.30 to, to 10. Okay, we had the 9 to 10 slot. And, you know, if you, some of you can only, can't be here 9.30 to, to 10, and if I put you in that slot, we'll just switch it around, let me know. Okay, it's also flexible and if some travel schedule comes up for me, we got an extra day scheduled already and I might have to move some people, but hopefully we don't want to do that. I put it down my schedule and I'll try to hold the days. I have no guarantees. My life is not that simple. Okay, um, any questions from before? If not, then let me just, this is another thing out of a magazine from a couple of years ago. Magnesium replaces plastic and die cast fishing reel frame, okay? Well, okay, this is nice, um, but you're not, you're not gonna get rich, you know, making magnesium, substituting magnesium for plastic. It actually probably is maybe lighter than the plastic, and it's certainly stronger, because typical plastic strengths, the highest strength plastics, unless they're super duper $400 a pound aviation type of plastics, the highest strength plastics are about 10 KSI, and you can get 20 KSI out of magnesium. So um, it can be stronger and stuff, but you know, I look at these things in this, these materials trade organization magazines, and I think, I always think, well, okay, um, these are the boutique applications or the boutique materials. Um, I did want to take in this last time, um, go through what are structural materials and what are the materials that we we use the very beginning of class I handed out this paper where I told you that 95 percent of all metal is iron and steel and number two was aluminum and copper and zinc well it turns out I actually spent the last 45 minutes looking on the web and came up with this which the numbers actually work out pretty close to what I had talked about, been talking about all term, and that is that of structural materials production, um, steel is about 1.5, I've been saying 1 billion to, uh, tons, it's 1.5 billion officially now. Cement is 2.2 billion, I've been saying 2 billion, uh, it's 2.2 billion, is growing rapidly. It's growing rapidly. I had a student do a, a bachelor's thesis on some of this type of stuff a few, about eight or 10 years ago. It was like 1.6 billion for cement and it was 1 trillion, or uh, let's see, 2 billion tons for, so, so at that time it was 1.6 billion tons for cement and it was one uh, or 800 or 900 um, million tons for uh, uh, steel. And they've been growing fairly rapidly. What shocked me when I looked this up this morning is the country that produces um, 2 billion tons of cement, 90% of the world's cement, is China. Okay? And obviously they weren't producing that much cement before. Obviously, there's, if you go to China, they're building lots of cement buildings and roads and dams and everything else. So anyway, uh, aluminum is 45 million tons, copper is 15 million tons. If you went back to this, you know, this graph that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, and hopefully this, some of this puts things into pers perspective. Not all of these are structural materials. Lead was a structural material. In fact, in the Middle Ages, lead was one of the most produced metals. Uh, we didn't have a, a steel industry or an aluminum industry and the copper industry was very, very small, but lead was one of the easiest things to get uh, from its ore, as was zinc. And so these were some of the primary metals back 300 years ago. Nickel, I mean, our whole aerospace engine technology and a lot of our corrosion resistance and nuclear reactors and things depend on nickel, two million tons a year. I remember when I was an engineer working in this industry and they were talking about building a pipeline from Alaska. This wasn't, they were already building the Alaska pipeline at that time, or it was about to go into service, but they were talking about another pipeline. And it had, I guess it was the gas pipeline they wanted to build. Had to have excellent toughness 
and International Nickel came up with this new alloy steel to make the pipe out of, and it had 1.5% nickel. And then someone did the calculation, there wasn't enough nickel in the world to supply that pipeline in an annual production, okay? Uh, so that didn't, <laughs> that didn't work out very well. Now, they did take that steel, and they, uh, it was a precipitation-hardened copper nickel steel, okay? It had fantastic mechanical properties. It was just blew away most other steels in, in, in that strength range and stuff. Um, but they, they found niche applications as crack stoppers. Um, a problem with steel, you know, I'm not saying steel is the most wonderful material in the world. It's just the largest used structural material. But they, they have had brittle fractures in pipelines that run for 30 miles. You know, you get a crack in it. If it's a gas pipeline, okay? An oil pipeline doesn't do that because an oil pipeline is pressurized hydraulically and the decompression wave in the oil or in the liquid is faster than the crack runs. But in a gas, it turns out the decompression wave in the gas is slower than the crack grow, a brittle crack will grow. A brittle crack will grow at half the speed of sound, which is maybe 1,500, 2,000 meters per second. Okay, it, it sounds like a rifle shot. You know, when, it, when that crack starts to go, it's a big bang. Um, and it's moving at, let's say, 1,500 meters a second. What's the velocity of sound in air at sea level? Sea level? 346, 343.6 meters per second at STP. Um, uh, I remember that from my high school physics. So 300 meters versus 1,500 meters, it means the crack is always under tension as it's, grown, as it's running. And gas pipelines had had, there had been one that a crack started and ran in a brittle steel and ran for 30 miles before it stopped. So they decided they were going to use the super duper steel and put little one foot rings in there about every mile so that if you know, the crack started running, it would hit one of these rings and it would stop. Okay, in a ductile material. So they were going to use it for that. Later on, the U.S. Navy decided it was a good steel for submarine hulls. Okay, so they did find an application. In any case, magnesium, we said, is 250,000 tons. Tin, which is not a structural material, is also 250,000 tons. I put it on there because it was on this, this list of this little graph that I had stolen from someplace. Okay, um, they had tin on here. Um, titanium, one of the wonder metals uh, kind of first developed over here at Watertown Mall. Actually, it was the Army Research Center at the time. Uh, it's now a mall. If you go over there, Home Depot, you know, TJ Maxx. Um, but um, titanium uh, is essential to the aerospace industry, but it's only 60,000 tons per year. I did learn that the B-1 bomber uses about 100 tons of magnesium, or B-2 bomber uses about 100 tons of magnesium to produce. Uh, that's not the weight of the aircraft. There only be maybe 10% of that weight actually gets into the aircraft, but you have to produce about 100 tons in order to get the parts, um, to produce the parts. Neodymium, which is obviously not a structural material, but we've talked about it, is 7,000 tons. Zirconium, which we'll talk about in a second, um, 3,500 tons. Scandium, which we talked about for baseball bats. It's basically an alloy element in aluminum. It's about the only application I know of. 2,000 tons, okay? Um, and I actually started doing it. Lithium is 600,000 tons, obviously not a structural material, but it's, grow it's grown by a factor of six in the last 10 years for battery applications. Silicon, seven million tons, okay? Silicon metal, we're not talking the semiconductor, well, actually, we could be talking the semiconductor grade, but 80% of all that silicon goes as an alloying element into steel. Okay, and another 20% or 19% or whatever number goes into an alloying element for aluminum. <laughs> okay, so most of the silicon that we ma silicon metal we make, very a very very small fraction goes into semiconductors because obviously you can put a lot of power on a little little chip that doesn't weigh much. Most of the silicon goes into making steel and aluminum as an alloying element. I looked up 
Beryllium, 200 tons. Beryllium market's dying. It went from 350 tons a year to 200 tons just in the last few years. Sodium, um, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going down the periodic table now. Um, and actually, I had thought once upon a time of rather than doing presentations, if I had a big class, I was going to give each person a, an element on the periodic table and have them do a, a presentation or a paper on the element and how it's used. I always thought that would be a fun course. I don't know who would ever sign up for it. So I teach it anyway. I just call it structural materials. <laughs> okay. I'm sandbagging you. I'm giving you an, the course I always wanted to teach, but no one would ever sign up for. So if I look at this, this is periodic table. And we kind of went through, <clears throat> and I put in yellow the real structural materials that we use in the world. There's iron, there's aluminum, but more importantly, there's crushed stone, silicon. Most of the stone, I mean, some of the stone is limestone, is calcium. Portland cement is over here with calcium. So the ceramic materials are actually the most highly used, followed by iron, followed by aluminum. Magnesium, a large fraction of the magnesium goes into anodes, only a relatively small fraction, like 25%, goes into structural materials, castings usually, because one of the problems with magnesium, aside from the fact it's hexagonal closed packed and you can't roll it very easily because it doesn't have enough deformation systems and you try to make a, you try to deform it to get a general shape change and because of the lack of slip systems. You, know, you learn about dislocations and things. Well, they only work in certain materials like cubic metals. Um, and magnesium is not a cubic metal. It's hexagonal closed packed. It deforms by twinning. And you will crack it if you try to give it a general shape change. Yes? At low temperatures, but at high temperatures, it becomes BCC. So when you make titanium sheet, you alloy it to get rid of that pesky old HCP phase, okay? But then you also do heat treatments to bring it back because that pesky old HCP phase actually has some good strength and other properties. So titanium and steel have this advantage that they're allotropic. They have a different crustal structure at high temperatures and low temperatures, and you can do all kinds of things to get interesting microstructures. And I haven't been talking about microstructures in this class. Uh, you know, I, I did my, my uh, doctoral work in physical metallurgy, but I ended up becoming more of a process metallurgist. But there's really interesting stuff. Titanium, you can cycle through this two, this allotropic phase transformation from one temperature <laughs> to a lower temperature. I don't know, I think it's around eight or 900 degrees centigrade. You cycle between that and you can get nucleation and growth, nucleation and growth, you get finer and finer grain size, and you can end up forming a super plastic alloy that allows you to do fantastic processing. And if you, if you take the deformation processing module, I'll spend, I spent a little time talking about superplasticity. And we wouldn't, superplastic forming of titanium really, um, it, I don't know if I want to say it transformed the, the, the aircraft engine business, but it sure made aircraft engines a lot cheaper than they would be otherwise. We can make structures out of titanium for jet engines that we never could have made any other way. So some of these things have very interesting properties. You could take, you could give a whole course on any one of these elements as a structural material. Well, not any one of them as a structural. Well, of the ones in yellow, yes, you can. Carbon is there because plastics. 300 million tons of plastics. But that's all plastics. And you can say, well, Professor Eager didn't mention much about plastics, and it's a pretty important structural material. It is. I'll tell you everything you need to know about plastics. They don't go above 500 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay? But below that, they're easy to form. If you get the right one, it has the right corrosion resistance in that environment. Don't put it in another environment. Okay, yes? You know, I was going to look that up, but I didn't kind of class ran in. I ran into class time, you know. I was actually thinking of spending part of my weekend, you know, kind of looking at more. It's so easy to do research on the web now, right? Uh, wood production, if I went back to my little plot, it's right up there underneath stone, okay? But the problem with wood production, what fraction of it is structural material? I mean, you can go find how many board feet of timber, and maybe that's 
but there's a lot of wood that goes into wood chips, you know, and um, the, most of the wood in the world is destroyed by bugs, okay? We just let it rot, okay, in the, in the forest because it's so difficult to harvest, okay? But except we find a good stand of it and we want to harvest the whole thing, every one, so we can just denude the landscape and, you know, destroy the environment and everything. But <coughs> wood is a... Wood always has been a fantastic material, and people still pay a premium to make things out of wood. I mean, go look in my office at my bookcases. I designed those, okay, and I had someone build them for me. It's wood. You know, metal would have been much cheaper. But I kind of like the cherry, you know. It looks, you know, a metal bookcase looks sort of industrial, right? Anyway. Um, so wood is, wood is a huge number, uh, but the problem is it's used for so many different things that are non-structural, which is one of the problems with some of these others. Magnesium, I may put down 250,000 tons, but only 25% is structural. Silicon, well, metallic silicon, 99% of it is used for um, alloying in, in steel or aluminum, and 1% of it is put into this huge profitability on value added you take a little chip of silicon just happens to be a single crystal and you can turn it into something that's worth five hundred dollars on a per pound basis that blows away any of our structural materials and there's a good reason for that structural materials are used in very large volumes and therefore you have to consider cost and I've been beating cost into you since day one right but why am I beating it into you did I tell you the story about it's about 20 years ago, a very prominent faculty member in our department now. But at the time, he was a, an untenured uh, associate or something. And we were walking across campus. We were right there in, in front of the great sale, I remember. And he says, well, did you see Professor Clark's paper in the Journal of Metals uh, this, this month? I said, yeah. He says, you know, I never thought about it before, but cost really is important. And I thought, what? You're an engineer and you didn't know that cost... He'd been an MIT undergraduate, graduate student, he's now a professor, and he didn't know that cost was an important criteria. And now he's made millions of dollars in his company spinoff, okay? I think he knows about cost now, but he learned it from Joel Clark by reading one of Joel Clark's articles. Okay. Uh, I just... <coughs> I guess I could tell you another, st another story. Your MIT education is actually a very good education for many reasons. I think I, I may have told you I consider an MIT undergraduate degree to be second only to Princeton as a general undergraduate degree in the United States. But if you know you're interested in science and engineering, I actually think MIT is better. Okay? Uh, we could talk about that. But um, So MIT is a great place to learn. And it gives you a lot of the tools, the attitudes and things, but it doesn't give you a very practical knowledge, right? And so some things, by telling you some of the stories, I give you, try to give you some ideas of practical knowledge. So when I was a senior, uh, Professor Fleming's, I had worked in his lab and he kind of liked me at that time. He hates me now, but, but uh, uh, he liked me at that time. And um, he, he has, he was the Foundry Educational Foundation professor. Each, they have professors at each school, and they controlled certain scholarships. And he saw me kind of walking down the hallway once when I was a junior, and I sort of dejected. And he said, why do you look so sad? I said, well, I just got my financial aid package for next year. It's 90% it's loan and 10% you know, scholarship or something. And he says, oh. And the next thing I know, I get a letter from the scholarship office and it turns into 100% scholarship from the Foundry Educational Foundation. Well, I wonder how that happened, okay? So Professor Fleming did me a nice little favor. Well, when I started out in senior year, the, uh, uh, he had the opportunity to send a student to the Foundry Educational Foundation Conference. These are places, people in the foundry industry want to hire MIT students, right? So they would take one of the, they'd have the FEF professor take uh, you know, find a student that they thought was a good student, be good for the foundry industry. And they sent him off to this conference. You stay at the Drake Hotel in Chicago. as a very fancy, very snooty hotel. First place I ever went into had real cloth in the restrooms, you know, for rather than paper towels. Uh, but I, I've seen those places since then. But they're kind of 
four or five hundred, six hundred dollar night hotels. And it was right across the street from the Playboy Club, which I guess I shouldn't be saying nowadays, but that was also probably a draw back in those days when it was 95% males at MIT and stuff. Anyway, so I actually just boldly said, well, well, why don't you send Harvey, why don't you send two of us, send Harvey Cohen? So he did. So Harvey and I both, I mean, Harvey probably wouldn't have gotten an invitation, but, but Professor Fleming's controlled enough money. So what was, I, what was I telling you that about? Oh, so we go to the FEF conference. And these are all practical guys who are sitting there in their, their labs. They're ramming sand molds and casting things and stuff. And they tell this joke about the ignorant foundryman who didn't know the difference between a cope and a drag. Now, how many of you know what a cope and a drag are? Say, so you're MIT students. You don't know. Well, the joke, I had heard it before. But I had heard it about the ignorant uh, Navy captain who didn't know port and starboard, which was right and which was left. Port is left and starboard is right, by the way. And, you know, they, they, uh, someone found this out once because they, one morning he it looked like he was meditating uh, at his desk. And in fact, someone was standing over him once and he pulled out the drawer and said, port is left, starboard is right. And he had a little crib sheet in there, okay? Well, they told the same joke with cope and drag. Okay, the cope is on the top and the drag is on the bottom. These are the two halves of the sand mold. Okay, and Harvey and I looked at each other. <laughs> we didn't know what a cope and a drag was, and they were telling this is you know the, how ignorant a foundryman would be not to have learned that. So part of your MIT education is to learn nothing practical, but to learn the fundamentals, and you will find that you can learn these other things like copes and drags and port and starboard. You can pick that up off the street. Okay, in about two weeks but you can't pick up Fourier's first law. You had to have learned that somewhere, okay? It's not intuitive, so. There is an advantage to an MIT education, but you will be made fun of when you get out there in the real world, when you pull some of these boners, like you don't know what a cope and a drag is, what's a drag? Um, anyway, so we've got all these structural materials, or these all these elements in the periodic table. Um, we've now talked about magnesium, Carbon is for plastics, silicon is for stone, um, and they are structural materials. Scandium, we've talked about, you can go look up, but about the only application of scandium I know is alloying and aluminum. Yttrium, what's yttrium used for? Anybody know? Stabilizes zirconium. Adam Powell yesterday said they got a problem. There's only so much yttrium in the world. I didn't look it up, but anyway. Actually, I did look it up somewhere, but I didn't write it down. Did I? No, I didn't. Anyway, so there's only so much yttrium. It's also used as an oxide growth promoter on turbine blades, iron chrome, aluminum, yttrium. Ficrelli or cocrelli, uh, cobalt chrome. Okay, I got that back. Okay. Cobalt chrome, aluminum, yttrium. If you want to have the absolute best high temperature oxidation resistance, you put a little yttrium in with the cobalt chrome if, and aluminum that you may have in your nickel-based superalloy. Or if you don't have any cobalt, because it's expensive, you, put, you have iron in there, and you will grow an oxide on the surface that has about 200 degree higher temperature capability of oxidation resistance. And so most of our turbine blades out there in the world are cochrally or fecrally um, alloy. You have to have like, it's like a thousand parts per million or less of yttrium, but you need yttrium, okay? Uh, lanthanum, I don't know any use of lanthanum except to make lanthanum hexaboride filaments for scanning electron microscopes and things like that. I mean, um, it's the lanthanide series, so it's famous for that. Titanium, 60,000 tons Titanium is a fantastic metal in many ways. I meant to bring, I have a little pacemaker can from 40 years ago. Uh, pacemaker that you put in your heart, you know, to signal your heart when to pump and stuff. Uh, they've been making them out of titanium for, you know, 50 years because titanium just doesn't corrode in the body. It also doesn't corrode in heat exchangers. It has, it, it's got good high temperature capability. Aluminum, you know, the Concorde flies on temperatures, the SST. 
Well, the SR-71 Blackbird had a titanium skin. It was one of the first titanium aircraft. Didn't have any aluminum. That aluminum wouldn't make it to 90,000 feet, okay? And the temperatures you get from the, the frictional heating at the speeds those things go, which are like Mach 3 or 4 or something, okay, at those altitudes. Uh, the B-2 bomber, you know, is mostly titanium uh, in terms of its skin uh, and things. So aerospace, it's relatively lightweight. It's not as light as aluminum, but in terms of melting point and temperatures, um, it's because it's lightweight and because it can be super plastically formed, we use it on, on the compressors of jet engines. We can make extremely complex structures, okay? Um, but it is very reactive. And if you get above 900 degrees centigrade, it's, it's, it's very corrosion resistant. The resistant has reasonably good oxidation resistance up to 900 degrees, but above 900 degrees, it will dissolve its own oxide. And all of a sudden, it catches fire. It's like a great big magnesium flare. And they've had engines go, boof, you know, just in a great big ball of fire, and they just end up with a burned out engine. Okay, completely burned out. Not a good day. That's why you have multiple engines, okay? It's also why you should control the way you operate the engine, so they're not designed to get to those temperatures. But some, some good old Air Force pilots have been able to do it. Um, zirconium. Primary uses of zirconium. There's only two I know of. Anybody know one? They're both structural. One's reactor fuel cladding. So you got this uranium or plutonium oxide pellet or whatever and you use, you put it inside a zirconium tube. I meant to bring one. I have a little piece of zirconium tube. Goes for about a hundred bucks a foot, okay? It's also a hexagonal close pack metal. It's not the easiest thing to form. Beautiful metallography. I mean, you can anodize it and you get these wonderful colors. I mean, it's like, it's like, look out there on the floor of that thing and all the colors. That could be a, that could, you know, change it a little bit to make it grain size and it be the color of a zirconium metallography. Um, but that's not a good reason to buy it. But why is it good for nu nuclear reactor fuel cladding? It's neutron transparent. It has one of the lowest neutron cross sections. Neutrons, like it doesn't exist to neutrons. It's measured in barns, right? Okay, whatever a barn is, but it's some measure of neutron flux. There's another material on this periodic table that I've skipped, boron. Okay, um, is a neutron poison. It accepts neutrons very, very well. Put a little borax in your water in your nuclear reactor and you can stop that reaction very quickly. So boron is a great material. Gadolinium is another wonderful material. They've actually made stainless steel alloys out of with a little gadolinium in them. In them. Um, here's gadolinium down here. Uh, other than that, gadolinium's claim to fame is one of the few ferromagnetic metals or uh, elements. There's only about four or five of them. Iron, nickel, cobalt, and gadolinium are the four ferromagnetic elements, at least at room temperature. And gadolinium just barely made it, okay? It's got a curie temperature only a few, few degrees above room temperature. But in any case, um, so there are these nuclear materials, zirconium, boron having the opposite uh, effects. Turns out hafnium, hafnium is uh, a neutron part, of, it's not really a neutron poison, but it's got a big neutron cross section. So in order to make zirconium fuel cladding, they had to get very, very low hafnium, zirconium, a very low impurity. And frankly, these things right here in these columns of the periodic table, they tend to be found together in nature, okay? If you have a zirconium ore, it's gonna have lots of hafnium or vice versa. Same thing about niobium and tantalum, okay? Two Greek gods, Sadoway told me once, Professor Sadoway, that they're called niobis and tantalus because they were tw Greek twins. I, I, I looked that up once, I'm not sure they were twins, but they have something to do with Greek mythology. And they were named that because it was so difficult to separate them. They're found in the same ores, and it's difficult to separate them. But that was what his doctoral thesis was about. Vanadium, vanad well, 
So we did hafnium, well, hafnium is used in some very high melting ceramics, but it's very pricey. Um, it's not really a structural material. One application I know of is in plasma torches, air plasma torches. Rather than tungsten electrodes, they have hafnium electrodes because when it oxidizes, the hafnium oxide actually still conducts enough electrons that you can still get the electric current through in your plasma torch. So rather than having a tungsten electrode, they have a hafnium electrode, which you expect to oxidize, and it will keep working, you know, just like the Energizer Bunny or something keeps on going. Um, but that's about the only application I know of haf hafnium. Vanadium. <coughs> um, vanadium is used mostly as an alloying element for steel, okay? Um, not in very large quantities, a tenth of a percent. You can get grain re refinement because vanadium forms carbides. Vanadium is called vanadium because after the Greek god of vanity, Vanus, okay? Vanadium forms beautiful colors in its salts. Sulfides, oxides, chlorides, and it has lots of them. It has almost every valence in the periodic table in vanadium. And it has all these different salts. It's a, considered a vein metal, okay? That's why they call it vanadium. Uh, tantalum. Number two after gold, basically, in corrosion resistance, okay? Fantastically stable oxide used to make the best capa uh, capacitors in the world. If you own a computer, you got some tan you purchased some tantalum with it. Very small amount, but it forms a very strong oxide, and you can make these uh, very fine porous powder metallurgy structures that you then anodize to form an oxide skin, and that becomes your capacitor, okay? So tantalum, kind of pricey about the price of silver, uh, but you don't use much. And if it's a medical thing, who cares? I mean, you know, doctors are making a fortune. Uh, who cares about the cost of the metal? Chromium. Chromium actually is 7 million tons. I looked it up. Just like silicon, metallic silicon, chromium is in here with lead. I mean, it's one of the most used metals so far as that goes, but it's almost all ferrochrome for uh, making steel, stainless steel. The other application is chrome plating. And they actually found, as I was doing this on Wiki, Wikipedia, if you can believe Wikipedia, um, apparently they found brass objects that people had put chromium oxide on thousands of years ago. So they dig this brass out of the ground and it doesn't, it's not tarnished because it's got a chromium oxide skin, just like stainless steel. Uh, chromium is essential for all our high temperature alloys. Either chrome or aluminum are what give nickel alloys and cobalt alloys and iron alloys their high temperature corrosion resistance. It's not the, the iron, nickel, and, and stuff. It's the chrome oxide. Uh, chromium is not a very good structural material by itself. It melts at over 2,000 degrees, makes a little pricey to process, but it's brittle by itself as a metal. You can take a hammer to it and it'll fracture, um, so far as that goes. But it's a very important metal. It only comes from a few places in the world. Uh, back well before you were born, um, there was all kinds of problems in Rhodesia. And Rhodesia has a chrome ore, chromite ore, that you don't even have to clean up. You can just take that rock out of the ground and throw it in the steel blast furnace, or throw it in the steel melting furnace. And so there was an embargo on Rhodesian chrome. You've heard of blood diamonds nowadays, you know, these war diamonds and what are the other uh, elements that, certain type of elements where some country has sort of a control and then they have a civil war and <clears throat> there's the diamonds in Angola. But before that, it was the chromium in Rhodesia and they had a worldwide embargo on Rhodesia and chrome, except <laughs> it was all leaking and getting to the steel mills anyway, and everybody knew it was Rhodesian chrome. It might have come through other, some other country and was laundered through some other country, but you could tell. No one else in the world had that quality of chrome, chromite ore, okay? But it comes from India and it comes from uh, parts of Russia. Uh, it's a, a strategic material in the sense that we don't have any uh, good U.S. source. We actually have lots of minerals, but we can't extract it cheaply enough uh, compared to these other uh, good deposits. Um, niobium is also used with vanadium as an alloying element in steel. 
Uh, we've kind of covered those. Molybdenum. Molybdenum is, well, it's close to tungsten in a lot of its properties, very high melting. But it's used as an alloying element in stainless steels. It's used as an alloying element in alloy steels. Um, it does have a few um, um, space uh, structural material applications because it has a very low coefficient of thermal expansion. So if I'm trying to build some telescope in space and it can't, you know, when the sun hits it, it can't thermally expand too much or it'll mess up my, uh, my optics and stuff, they might use molybdenum in that spacecraft, even though it's very heavy, very dense, it's got very good thermal conductivity. Um, uh, there are some molybdenum rhenium alloys, okay, that have a lot of these high temperature alloys will be molybdenum rhenium. Um, rhenium is is uh, used for molyrhenium alloys, but it's it's a refractory, it's a platinum group metal. Okay, these are the platinum group metals along here. Uh, not from tungsten, but um, and then ruthenium and rhodium. Those guys all make the what they call the platinum group metals. Uh, we're getting the rhenium out of turbine blades, but I don't know if I told you the story that. When I took the, my creep course from Professor Grant, who had developed a lot of these alloys, the first question in his class was, uh, what's the best material for making a high temperature turbine blade? And we all guessed, you know, nickel or cobalt and stuff. And he says, no, platinum. Doesn't oxidize in the air, goes to 1700 degrees C, has excellent strength, easy to form. Only problem is it costs too much. Um, well, rhenium was one of the cheaper um, platinum group metals and um, they ended up putting within the last, let's say around 2000, we were getting to 6% rhenium in those turbine blades, which is why those turbine blades cost six, seven, eight thousand dollars a piece. We made 6% of them as platinum group metal. Um, but in any case, we're da but getting back down. They're learning to take the rhenium out. Um, ruthenium, the only application I've ever heard, hexagonal closed packed. A guy came to me once, he wanted to make ruthenium uh, BBs basically for ballpoint pen tips. Okay, it's hexagonal closed pack, so I had to show them how to melt it to make in surface tension would make it spherical. Uh, osmium, I know of no application of osmium except among the biologists, they use it to stain os osmium tetroxide to stain cells. But when you get to osmium and iridium, these things are produced in hundreds of ounces per year in the world. They're not exactly something you're going to choose for a structural material. Although iridium is used for a structural material, the Voyager spacecraft that's heading out of the solar system now, or just is officially headed out of the solar system after, what, 30 or 35 years going out there, it's powered by plutonium and a thermoelectric generator. There's not enough sun, sun's radiation when you get that far away from the sun to provide the energy to go beaming back the signals and stuff. And so the Voyager spacecraft was plutonium in an iridium sphere. And iridium melts at a high temperature. And if you add a little tungsten and some other things to it, uh, you won't have a, uh, you'll have ductility. And so when I was, I had been interviewed by Oak Ridge when I was uh, graduating and they wanted to, they offered, finally offered me a job. But I saw a file cabinet down in Oak Ridge, Tennessee that had about 50% of the world's supply of iridium because they were making these little things for things like the, for NASA, uh, for the Voyager space class. Iridium is also good for um, platinum jewelry. Made my wife's engagement ring out of platinum iridium. Electron beam melted it. Um, tungsten, I sort of skipped. You know what tungsten is used for? Light bulbs, okay? This is what made Thomas Edison a rich man. Uh, Coolidge, what was Coolidge's first name? Anyway, Coolidge um, became one of the directors of research at General Electric, but he was an MIT grad. And, in fact, he became a wealthy man, and he gave 350 acres or something to MIT up in, uh, begins with a T, it's up here on the North Shore. But uh, at one time they thought of moving MIT from Cambridge up to these 350 acres up there because Cambridge was such a pain in the neck to live in. Uh, I'm not for the students necessarily, but for dealing with the politics here. 
Okay, but anyway, they finally decided to stay in Cambridge. Um, but uh, they they they, uh, they caught the uh, anyway. Oh, that's a different Coolidge for the X-ray tube. But anyway, the Coolidge process for making tungsten wire was the thing that made the light bulb pro possible. And the Cleveland wire plant of General Electric, they used to say, if you want to be a metallurgist, just go to the Cleveland wire plant and you get burned out. Because metallurgists would go there and the only thing you could work on was controlling grain size in, t in tungsten, okay? That's what gives light, tungsten light bulbs, incandescent light bulbs their life, is making it resistant to, to grain growth. Um, cobalt. Cobalt's hexagonal close, close packed, and it has interesting property. It has 10 times lower wear than any other metal. Because they say it's because of hexagonal close pack, pack, but just empirically, if you have a wear problem, do a, a, a cobalt overlay, weld overlay, and you, you may get around the problem, okay? You get 10 times better wear resistance with cobalt uh, alloys. Those $300 scissors, they had a cobalt insert, okay, to keep, keep them sharp, yep. Uh, maybe, I don't know the cobalt tool company. Oh, no, 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 that's, uh, I think that's, well, I, I have to go back and see. Okay, I, I have seen cobalt tools. Oh, they, they're the blue, they have the big blue. Yeah, okay, that type of, um, I don't know, okay. You don't hear me say that very often, but uh, I don't know, okay. I don't think it is, but certainly Canametal and um, some other companies that spe specialize in carbides and, and stuff ha did kind of start with some of the cobalt alloys and their wear resistance. Cobalt has excellent high temperature properties for turbine blades and stuff, but it, what happened is most of the world's cobalt comes from the, the old Belgian Congo, which is Zaire now. And that's in the middle of a civil war most of the last 50 years. And so the supply of cobalt is not reliable. People are concerned about that. Nickel alloys, well, nickel alloys are, are interesting, just like the stainless steels. When you need more alloy capability than, than uh, or corrosion resistance than stainless steel can give you, you go to nickel rather than iron base. Although the, the metallurgy is similar and the alloying elements are still chrome and moly and stuff. This is nickel content versus molybdenum con content. Chloride ion stress corrosion cracking and you got down here some of your alloy 800, alloy 600 and 601. Those are nearly pure nickel, um, like 80% nickel. Um, and zero molybdenum, which is expensive. 304 stainless is right here. 316 stainless is right here. And you keep on going up in these Inconel 825 alloy, 256, which is a super, uh, it's probably a super ferritic, or maybe it's a super austenitic. I have to go back and look. Alloy 625, used in a lot of pressurized water reactors. C276, used in really, really severe corrosion in oil refineries and things like that. But look at it. 16% moly and 16% nickel. This is not a cheap alloy, okay, so far as that goes. Um, as I'm doing that, I also realize that I, oh, well, let me show you something else about the nickel alloys in terms of the comparison with the stainless steels. Here's the cyclic exposure for oxidation versus mass loss. 3.0 steel bites the dust in two or 300 hours uh, at 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're talking about oxidation resistance, you get to the nickel alloys and all of a sudden here your, well here are your super, the highly alloyed heat resistant stainless steels. Here are your 800 series Inconels. Here are your 600 series Inconels and you can go for much, much longer times at very high temperatures. So. Um, again, if you're willing to start paying sixty to a hundred thousand dollars a ton, then you can get fantastic properties. But one of the reasons we don't use but so much uh, nickel in the world is because it's kind of pricey. Uh, but it has great properties. If if nickel was as cheap as iron, steel would not be important. Okay.
Um, it's almost a one-to-one -one substitute in many, many alloys. But the price of nickel has fluctuated a lot. One of the times, uh, <laughs> Bob Rose, my thesis advisor, used to like tell the story of uh, one of his former students from MIT was working for International Nickel, and the price of nickel shot up. And so they, they came to him. He's in the research labs. And the, his manager said, well, we need a replacement for nickel. <laughs> and so he had to go off and you know, he thought, this is stupid. I mean, you're going to replace elements in the periodic table? So he came back and he said, well, palladium works well. <laughs> Palladium's a platinum group metal. <laughs> okay, It's more expensive than nickel. Uh, palladium now, at that time, palladium didn't have a big application. What's the big application for palladium now? 80, 90 percent. Catalytic converters for cars. Okay, the only thing that works to burn carbon at low temperatures to oxidize carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide is either platinum or palladium or rhodium, which is even more expensive. Rhodium and iridium actually have applications as catalysts themselves in production of acetic acid. Um, they are the catalyst. But in fact, as one person, one chemical engineer told me once, when you're running an acetic acid plant, you're not really producing acetic acid. You're running a, an iridium or platinum recovery plant because you can't afford to have any rhodium or iridium end up in that acetic acid and being used, you know, as an impurity. I mean, it's just too, ex this stuff is too expensive, you know, $2,000 an ounce, okay? I didn't tell you the second application for zirconium. We talked about nuclear fuel cladding. The second application is if you want to make acetic acid, you can either make it out of a nickel molybdenum alloy, um, which is Hastelloy B3, okay, alloy, which is pretty pricey, or you can make it out of zirconium, which is even pricier, Hasteloid B3 will last for 30, 40 years, and that your plant will be good for 30 or 40 years before you have to scrap the $100 million plant. Make it out of zirconium, it'll last for centuries. Okay? Zirconium, and you can make it out of titanium. The only problem is every now and then you get hydrogen into your titanium and the plant explodes. Okay? But aside from that, titanium is very good in acetic acid, except it sometimes will pick up hydrogen. Um, you know, I haven't done copper, silver, and gold. They're kind of known historically. Copper is one of the most used metals, and I can tell you some stories on copper. Zinc, zinc use is 12 million tons. Okay, zinc is, of the ones I came up with here, it's number four in worldwide production of metals, but most of it goes as a sacrificial anode to make galvanized steel. Okay. Um, it's been around for centuries, okay? Zinc, lead, and uh, zinc and lead and tin have been used for centuries. Uh, copper tin was, were the bronzes of thousands of years ago. We learned to make zinc the last four or five hundred years by carbothermic reduction. Um, and we do make zinc. Uh, we make things, uh, well, back when I was your age, the door handles on cars might be a zinc die casting. Nowadays, they've made stronger plastics and they make them out of plastic and they put a chrome plate on them. Okay? So they, they used to be zinc with a chrome plate, so far as that goes. Anyway, um, anything else that we ought to go? We kind of marched across. You start getting over here, and these are low melting alloys. You get over here, these are sort of, they're not, they're not metals or they're gases. And they tend to be impurities in metals. Um, cadmium has lots of good properties for corrosion resistant coatings, but it's got a low vapor pressure and it's great for silver solders. Um, anyway, if you go back to it, to kind of go back to my original theme here, <coughs> if we're talking about structural metals, <coughs> there's only a few of them steel, aluminum. Some applications of copper, some applications of zinc. Lead is, we're trying to get lead out of the world right now. Nickel, essential for high temperatures. Magnesium, the hope for the future, has been for the last 50 years and probably will be for the next 30 or 40, in spite of what Adam Powell hopes. Um, titanium, it's just too pricey, takes too much energy to, to produce it. 
the U.S. government had a huge program a few years ago to try to make low-cost titanium for armor, <clears throat> but you got to get it down below $10 a pound, and they couldn't do it. It's around $100 a pound, okay? And then we have these other elements, niche applications, zirconium. It has this nuclear cross-section, or it has this corrosion resistance, and some of these things, but we're getting down to things where we're in thousands of pounds a year, and doesn't matter, you know, dysprosium. Adam talked about dysprosium. You want to talk really big volumes? Well, there's cement and there's stone. I had to estimate that. I did get from the, U the, U the United States uses 1.72 billion uh, pounds or tons of stone. And if you know that the United States is about 25% um, of the world's economy, stone is probably even more than this, but I just put 6 billion out. Stone dwarfs everything else. We could, if you're in civil engineering, they teach you a whole course on cement and the chemistry of cement and properties of cement and because it's a composite or the concrete is. Plastics, you know, plastic is replacing a lot of things. Uh, this is just simple polyethylene, but it's gas pipe. We used to make the pipe out of steel. Before we made it out of steel, we made it out, the pipes out of wood. We used to take trees and drill them out and bury them in the ground and put some mastic around the joints and that's how they transported the gas to make this for the street lights okay in the 1880s i mean i've seen old wooden pipes that were dug out of the ground in boston that were part of the old street light system of 150 years ago now we're going to plastic and plastic there are so many plastics that you'd need a whole course just to talk about all the different plastics uh, but plastics they always tell you they're corrosion resistant they are in the right environment. And they don't corrode but the same way metals do, but going back to their oxides, but they coined another term, the, the, uh, because the uh, uh, plastics people say plastics don't corrode, and the corrosion engineers knew that wasn't true, but they were looking for a better name than corrosion or you know hot corrosion, I always call hot rot, okay? Um, corrosion is sort of a, a dirty term. They now call it environmental degradation of materials. So if you want to talk about, about environmental degradation, certain environments will just destroy plastics, okay? And it doesn't have to be a very sophisticated one. I don't have a piece of Delrin here, but DuPont, did I tell you the Delrin story? Polyacetate, okay, a polyacetal, but it's basically a very simple polymer. And DuPont came out with polyacetal, which they called Delrin, as their trade name, D-E-L-R-I-N, in 1958. There's a paper that has 200 different solvents, and they said, this is the plumbing material of the future. And they had 200 different solvents that it was uh, resistant to, so you could pour any organic you wanted, any solvent you wanted down the sink, and nothing in your food was going to touch it. The one solvent they didn't check, water. I'm not kidding. You read this paper. They never checked water, <laughs> okay? And it turns out if it's very pure water, and nuclear reactor water would be great. Delrin would last forever. But if it has half a part per million chlorine, it will start to decompose, and it will crack. And so about 10 years ago, there were, well, first of all, Hos Selenes, who made, had a large part of the market, not as big as DuPont, they had a $900, billion class, uh, $900 million class action settlement. DuPont had a class action settlement, but it's classified, okay? Or it's not classified, but it's secret, confidential. But we know it had to be above a billion dollars for all these plumbing applications of Delrin, okay? But a half a part per million chlorine would cause the stuff to de decompose, and people would talk about the exploding toilets. Well, they weren't exploding. But they would make the, 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 the valve that, you know, when you flush the toilet, the water closet, you know, the, all the water rushes in and flushes the toilet, and then you have to have this valve that lets more water in. You have the little float that stops everything. That valve used to be made out of Delrin. And most water, EPA standards, it's not potable water if it has more than 100 parts per million chlorine. Cambridge water is like 5 ppm chlorine. 10 times what Delrin can, uh, can support. You know those little blue tablets that you know, you're, you're, uh, they put in the, the toilets? 
they're basically salt tablets full of chlorine. And you put one of those in, and you start, you start seeing the blue color, and it's probably 3,000 ppm chlorine. And those things will just destroy the delrin within months. And so what would happen is the valve would crack, and they get 60 psi water shooting straight up against the top of the ceramic lid, and it would push the ceramic lid off, and it'd come crashing to the floor. People would hear this big crash, and they, they called them exploding toilets. They weren't exploding. It was just the water pressure was knocking the, the ceramic cap off, and the ceramic was falling to the ground and crashing. Anyway, lots of floods. I made a lot of money off that. Anyway, uh, so when they tell you plastics are corrosion resistant, I would say, in what environment? Okay, the, cer the, cer the, the corrosion engineers now d define themselves as environmental degradation of materials. Metals corrode, but plastics and ceramics environmentally degrade, depending on their environment. Everything will corrode over time, except gold. We find it in nature. Platinum is usually pretty good. But if you look at just the earth and you go to places that have been weathering away for a billion years, you don't find much except old worn out stones. Anyway, <clears throat> um, I look forward to your presentations. You can come and see me if you have some problems. If you got here a little bit late, here's the schedule for the presentations. Pick it up uh, so you'll know when you're doing it. I'm sure I'll have Jerry email it around. A few of you haven't given me topics yet. I would like to, to know <clears throat> you're at the the later end of some of these presentations because you haven't picked the topic and told me yet. But I'll see you. Simone will be here.